Hi, it's Barney from BBC Good Food and welcome to our Thursday afternoon sourdough Q&A. So I'm going to be joined, hopefully be joined very shortly by my friend, colleague and fellow sourdough baker, Anna Glover. And uh, we're here to answer as many questions as we can about sourdough baking, but we will accept questions about general baking, about general cooking, about other breads. We did have someone mention, um, mention that would we be doing other artisan breads? And we will, we can do any breads that you like. So I'm gonna say hi to Anna, waiting for Anna to join us. And hopefully she'll be here soon. Connecting, connecting, connecting. Anna! I'm here, hello. Oh, lovely to see you. Oh, listen, a bit, bit of background about all of this. We spend, we, before like, us, we, we, we'd we spend five days a week together. So whenever I see like any of these guys, any of the rest of the team, I'm, feeling, I'm, feeling, I'm, feeling, I'm seeing a friendly face against someone I haven't actually seen for, for weeks. Lovely to see you, Anna. Are you frozen on my screen? But uh, we'll get there. I'll have you back. Sure. Okay, there we go. That's good to hear. Um, so how's, have, you been, <laughs> so have you been baking lots? Yeah, I have. Um, not in the last couple of days. I think it's been a bit too hot to turn the oven on. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, I've been doing lots of uh, lots of sourdough baking in lockdown. I've also made your sourdough cinnamon rolls, which were absolutely incredible. They're good, so they? lots of things. Yeah, lots of breakfast things as well. So remember, sourdough isn't just for savoury bread. You can use the starter for uh, sweet baking as well. So we've got there's a lovely recipe. On BBC Good Food, on cinnamon rolls, and for for enriched doughs, and for enriched doughs, I mean, it'd be really good in hot cross buns or in in babka or 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 anything like that. Right then, we've got some questions. So you're a fellow sourdough baker. Your bread is amazing. I've seen it on Instagram. I'm yet to try it, but it is it is picture perfect. So these questions go out to both of us, and these are questions from my Instagram. So first off, um, for uh, for proving baskets, is there a benefit to using them without linen? Um, I would question to you: Do you use one with linen or without linen? So I started using one with linen, and then actually I found it, um, more difficult to clean it than to use no linen at all. So I've got like a spiral, you know, like a spiral banneton, and I do think it is better without it. I just think like when whenever I've um, whenever I've uh, baked uh, and tip the bread out, I always just tap out and brush out the excess flour, and I don't necessarily like you know wash water, uh, water put water on it completely. So I do think it's better without. What do you think? Uh, if you're doing very wet doughs, then I think without a doubt linen is is really helpful. And if you're a beginning baker, it's really helpful because it's less chance of it, it's very less chance of it sticking. You do need to build up like a natural uh, kind of patina to, to the to the linen before it before it starts to stick. And the linen can be if um, natural fibres can go a bit mouldy. So you need to make sure that you leave them somewhere where you don't want to leave them stacked on top of each other. If you do, you need to, you need to put them so they're across each other rather than actually stacked on top of each other because they can go mouldy. But so I do find that, but one thing I like about not using linen is the lovely pattern you get, especially if you've got those caned banetons. So you get that beautiful pattern before you've even scored it and it looks a lot more artisan. Sorry, I keep uh, quitting out. Hopefully my internet will be a bit better now. Um... Okay. You're, okay. Um, are you back with me? Um, okay, cool. So we've got why... Uh, have we answered um, how do you get an open crumb? The question. How do you get... No, we haven't asked how do you get an open crumb or why does my sourdough stick to the bantam? Let's do open crumb first. How do you get an open crumb? A couple of things. You can up your hydration. So uh, you use more water, but your dough will be a lot harder to work with. Um, that is one way. The other thing is to treat your dough really gently. So unlike uh, classic yeast bread or a, you know a, a, a standard bread, 
you don't want to knock it back. You don't want to knock the air out of it. You want to keep those bubbles in it. So if you're a lot more, if you're gentle with the dough and try and keep the air bubbles that you've made, you'll get a more of an open crumb. The other thing you want to do is up your hydration better. But in this temperature, and I don't know if you've been baking it over the last week because everything's going mad. And I've yeah. found I've to drop my hydration a lot. So I'm baking bread at like 60, 60% hydration which is 300 grams of water to 500 grams of flour. And in the winter, that would be really low. And because everything's like, see, I, I bake a loaf of bread in my oven to be like a space, what should take about four hours in, a, in, a, in, an, in an hour. Well, the process took about an hour on, on Wednesday night because it was so warm. You know, that was, uh, I did all my stretch and turns and then um, I left it. And the second prove, which normally, you know, in a normal room temperature, normally takes three hours. That took yeah. it, it was up in forty. It was up in forty-five minutes. Yeah, yeah. I actually um, I keep my stuff in the fridge because there's only two of us. I don't really I don't need to bake more than once yeah. once a week really. And um, I had some starter in the um, fridge, and I just wanted to make some simple like flatbreads with a curry last night. And I just put a few tablespoons of the cold starter in the dough and it works perfectly they they rose really nicely so i think it's just the warmth as well is really helping um it did i didn't need to like activate it overnight or anything so that was instant and then you just you literally mix the two together and put them and cook them on a cook them on a griddle yeah yeah i just did them in like a dry frying pan just uh i probably proved it for like 30 40 minutes and then just rolled them out and they, they were really fluffy it was lovely now, I forgot to add to this, we've got some really exciting news at the end. If you stick with us in the Q&A, we've got a big announcement to make about sourdough, about how you can learn more about sourdough, but we will, we will let you know about that at the end. Uh, another question, why does my sourdough stick to my banneton? Um, if your sourdough is sticking lots, um, I've had this problem because, and especially in this weather, then I would say line it. So that goes back to what we were saying before. And then the question I've got for you, do you use semolina flour to, to dust or do you use another flour other than wheat flour? Do you use corn flour or rice flour? So I've I uh, heard a really good tip of using uh, like a uh, rice flour to just because it's a better, you know, it, um, it doesn't go as like claggy when the water from the bread comes out. But actually, uh, at the moment, I don't have any. I've just been really heavily dusting the banneton and then chilling it overnight seems to firm it, firm them up quite quite well. Um, and I find that they're easy to get out when they're cold. So I'd say exactly the same as that, that if, if once your bread is made, dusting the outside quite heavily with flour is going to make any difference to the recipe and it does help it not stick. So once... I mean, once I've made my dough, I am quite and I'm quite generous before I score it as well. I'm quite generous with the flour because I don't want it to stick. Now, if it is sticking, the best thing to do is to hold it upside down and just try and prise it. So I'm trying to see where, where I can see it. Just try and prise it away from the banneton and let it fall naturally. And sometimes, if you're gentle with it, it will come away. And if, if for some reason there's a tear in it, just try and fold that tear back onto the loaf and then bake it. It might not be perfect, but you'll still have delicious bread. And I read a really good tip. Um, I read a really good tip the other day, actually. I can't remember where I read it. But I read that if your bread is overproved, and overproving is going to be a real problem in this heat because everything's going mad, you can turn your bread into really nice focaccia. So if you if you open the fridge door and or you've left your bread out and you think, okay, I'm going to leave it for a couple of hours, but because it's 30 degrees outside, everything's gone bonkers and the, the bread has gone completely mad, then tip it out of the bowl and put it into a shallow tray, poke your fingers in it, drizzle it with olive oil and bake it straight away and you'll have beautiful focaccia. So overproved bread, so rather than baking it and then having it uh, go all floppy in the oven, overproof bread you can turn into really nice focaccia. So there's a there's a good tip. Excellent. Uh, Sorry if I keep cutting in and out. Um, okay. Can you make them gluten free? What questions have we got here? Why does my score not deepen or split as much? Um, you don't know how much. Scoring your your pips Sorry, I'm just having right. internet issues here. Um, I think I'm still live, so I think I'll, I'll answer this question. Which question are we on? Sorry. Um, 
Does your why does your scores even or split or not split? Because I've seen your bread, your, your bread opens up beautifully. How how do you what are your tips to score? Do you score when it's cold? Do you make sure you're close to right? Yeah, scoring. Um so I wrap my um loaves in foil and I feel like that I've tried a few different methods I've tried like linen bags I've tried like large cake tins and I find that tin foil and I kind of like use a large thick tin foil sheet and then reuse it for a couple of as well just to like reduce using it every time and I feel like that kind of gives you you keep really nice crust that way I find if it's too tightly wrapped you do lose the crust um What's what would you say what, sorry, what's the, are you talking about scoring? Are you talking about baking? You've lost me, Anna. I'm here, sorry. Okay, you've lost me. Right, I, I was uh, the question I was asking was why does my the, the question that we had is why does my score not deepen or split as much? And uh, I was saying, right, if it doesn't open up as much, you probably need a tighter loaf or make sure that you're doing it really cold. Now, what I've been doing in this really hot weather is before I score it, I've been putting it in the freezer for 20 minutes because the colder the bread, the tighter the gluten and the, the, the more my score seems to open up. So that's a tip for you. You can do it from, don't want to keep it in the freezer for too long, I'm going to keep it in the freezer for about 20 minutes and then you get this hard, it's much uh, kind of tougher uh, shape that, that, that holds its shape a lot more before you score it. Right then, so here's a question. Question two, are you here with me, Anna? I think so, oh. I don't know for how long for, but <laughs> we, yeah. Fantastic. Is a starter made from flour meant to be stretchy? Mine sometimes seems stretchy, which is different to what I've seen in a lot of videos. So what question to you, what flour do you make your starter with? And is your starter really stretchy? So I use a strong white bread flour for mine. Um, and I guess it depends in what sort of um, phase it is at the fermentation. Sometimes I find that it is really stretchy. Sometimes I find it's quite like watery on top or a little bit foamy. And I think um, if I, if you leave it in the fridge for a couple of days, it does seem to get quite like uh, like soft and, you know, stringy. And I feel like it's absolutely fine. It doesn't matter. It works the same. I find it, if it's looser or if it's thicker, I find it works the same. Um, I'm exactly the same, actually. And what I have done, I've done a, I've done a time lapse uh, for something. I'm going to post it or either on my Instagram or we'll, we'll get it on. We'll get it on Good Food Instagram. A time lapse photography, five minutes of what of what an active starter looks like. And as you, it doesn't. It's not really about the texture. It's not about whether it's stringy or whether it's liquid. It's about how much activity is going on in it. And if you look at your starter and you're seeing lots of little bubbles coming up to the top and bursting, then you know you're good to go. If the, if it looks dead and it, that there's not much going on, then then you need to feed it. You need to you need to keep it going. And we have had. I think this is quite an interesting question, uh, especially given the hot weather. Is it possible to extend bulk fermentation proving times for sourdough to fit in with a schedule? Oh, you've gone. Uh, Sorry, okay. I thought I might be back, but uh, what well, I missed the question. Right then, um, uh, someone was asking about um, is it is it possible to extend bulk fermentation proving times for sourdough to fit into a schedule? And I I was saying with this hot weather, a uh, question my question to you was whether or not how much do you use a thermometer? Do you take the temperature of your water? Do you or do you just kind of feel your way around it? The same as me. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of, I feel like um, every time I bake a loaf, I feel like, you, I, I think the best thing to do is like write notes yeah. and with every, every loaf that you've done and um, see if you tweak things slightly, how it works for you. Because I feel like everyone's oven, everyone's yeast, um, everyone's kitchens are so different and like a method that works best for you. And so if you write down notes, you'll know exactly what you did if you have a good, if you had a good loaf. Um, yeah. Now... If you want to extend the bulk fermentation, the proving, or in fact the proving we're making difference to the bulk fermentation, then just use cold ingredients. So the colder you are the temperature of your dough, the longer it's going to take. The warmer, the, the, the quicker it's going to take. So 
temperature will equal speed. I, I say this every every week, but it's, it's a temperature will equal speed, but time will equal flavor. You don't want to leave it so long that your bread becomes too sour. And we have got another question coming up saying, how can I make my bread taste more sour? You'll get that sour flavor with time. If you leave your bread in the fridge to prove for 18 hours, you will get a, a very sour flavor. You can bake sourdough straight away. You don't even need to put it in the fridge. But the longer you leave it in the fridge, the more the flavor will develop. And that's how you get a really sour flavor. But if you want to fermentation time or you want to fit it into a schedule, then you use you use um, or you use temperature as your as your brakes or your accelerator and that's the way to that's the way to fit it into a schedule sorry i missed that uh, um, have, you tried, have you tried the right, fermentation in the fridge overnight as well and then if you yeah, do yeah. the folding and the kneading the day after I found that like if it's getting too late and I haven't done um too many folds I actually put it in the fridge and leave it so that'll slow it down and then you can start it again the next day yeah exactly and what I do the starter, the water, and the fl and the flour, and I haven't added the salt yet. With cold water, I mix that together first thing in the morning. Put it in the fridge. Jump on my bike. Full day at work. Come home. Then add my salt. Then the rest of the process. And that is my tip to to schedule it. Um, so I, you know, you can extend it, but as long as you use temperature as your temperature as your gauge. So temperature is your brakes or your accelerator. Um, and then that, that will work in with your in with your schedule. Got another nice question. Hi, this is my question. Is my starter good for the first first two days bubbles and then three day three onwards it doesn't bubble? I get hoops sitting on top. What do I do? If you have so I honestly think that if you in the right environment in this weather, you're gonna be able to you could quite easily make a starter in two days. And I say this, I've seen a starter made ready to bake with in three days, I mean, I've never seen it in two, but I've seen it done in three days in my own kitchen, and I've seen it take up to two weeks. So given the fact you've got our windows open, the fact it's so warm, the fact there's a lot of activity, I can't see why there wouldn't, there, there isn't a reason that the starter wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be ready to use in two days. If you've got the hooch, which is the gray water sitting on top, then just mix it up mix everything together, mix that hooch back into it. It means that your starter is active. It means that the bacteria has done its thing. It means that it's it's fed um, and then give it a good feed and you'll be ready to bake with in a, in a couple of hours, if not if not tomorrow. Yeah, I always I also find um, like when I first started baking sourdough that I was quite reserved with how much I was discarding. And I yeah. feel like it's actually more active and a lot more lively if I discard a little bit more than half and just yeah. have, um, especially in like warm weather and things. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so, you know, there are lots of things you can do with your, there are lots of things you can do with your discard. We've got a whole, we've got a whole guide on bigsuperfood.com about what to do with your discard and we've got absolutely lots to do with it. But at some point, if you're not baking on a daily basis, you will need to discard some. Um, and that is at some point you need to give your you need to give your staff a big feed and, uh, and and give it a real boost. Okay, so does okay we've got a um, a question here. How do I get a harder crust on my low? Sometimes the crust goes soft after my bread cools. My question for that person asking us that question would be, are you using a casserole dish? Because that is the best way to get a crust in a domestic oven. Um, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't talk about it enough. That is the moment that will change everything. You do can get decent bread. You can get decent bread without one, but you will get beautiful, brilliant bread with one. And that is where you get your crust from. So if you're not using a casserole dish, Look up our recipe, go to the casserole dish method and start doing that. 
Um, if you are, then send us another question and uh, we'll try and answer it. But that is how you get a lovely crust. And also, don't be scared to take your bread a little bit further than you think. That colour is flavour. And actually, the true, like the true sourdough aficionados, they don't really care about the beautiful scores on the bread or how gorgeous it looks. They're, their loaves are really, really kind of gnarly and rustic. But what they do do is they take them further than you'd think because it's kind of like it's got this toasty flavour on the outside. And, and that gives you a really lovely crust as well. So take your bread a little bit further and you'll get lots more flavour and, and a really nice crust. Um, right then. Does whole, wheat, does whole wheat flour start to provide a former less watery starter? Sorry, does whole wheat flour start to provide a less watery starter? Um, yes, I'd say it does, and rye flour does as well. So it's it's uh, it's a rougher flour, so it, it kind of it turns into a thicker starter, but it will still ferment and it will still do what it needs to do. You still do 50-50 of each. It's still 50 uh, flour, 50, 50 water. You will have a thicker starter, though, because I made some rye starter. Actually, I brought some rye starter back the other day, and I, I actually thought to myself, this is a lot thicker than... than um, than white flour. Um, if you keep your starter in the fridge, do you still discard most of it when you feed it? Really good question. So you keep your starter in the fridge? Yeah, yeah, yeah? I do. And, and do you use it straight from the fridge? Feed it before you use it? What, what how, how do you talk us through the process? So should you bake once a week? You, yeah, so you... I take, take it out the, of the fridge and then I use a tablespoon of that starter to start the levan so then that's 100 grams flour 100 grams of water and then start then that that's when the fermentation starts and then with any that's left over then i will make uh, other things and yeah. just keep one tablespoon and then feed that and then put that back in the fridge so it's almost like so it's fresh it's starting it's got fresh food uh, to start that process when it goes back in the fridge and do you wait for it to bubble up or do you just feed it then put it in the fridge I just put it back in the fridge. Yeah, yeah I don't, I don't um, let it bubble up. I kind of feel like I want to give it as much food as possible in store, in in like hibernation. Exactly. So I just sit, sit slowly uh, in there. Um, but then when I, so it does take possibly like twelve hours longer than if it was from you, uh, if you were using, if you had like a really big bulk starter and you're putting all of that into your bread. So I just have to just give it a kickstart before I use it. I'm exactly the same, and it, this is what we were talking about. It's a really lovely way of putting it in hibernation. But this is what we were talking about before: that the, the you feed your starter and you put it in your fridge um, without letting it bubble first. That same process happens; it just happens a lot slower. So I exactly that. I sometimes feed my starter because I've used it, and then I put it in the fridge, and then um, and then two days later, when I want to bake again, I pull it out and it's perfect. I mean, it's floating consistency because yeah. that 12 hour process has taken two days because it's two degrees as opposed to being 28 degrees. The process still happens. It just happens a lot slower. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a really lovely tip. So you don't need to discard most of it. I've actually, I, I've, to be honest, I've skipped the whole labor stage now. I'm just using my starters. I'm using my starter as a labor. But we will be talking about that another time. Um, I live in a tropical climate and my crusts are great out the oven but tend to go softer a few hours. How do I maintain a hard crust? Um, so you live in a tropical climate. That sh I would say for that you just need to make sure you're calling out the cooling rack. Um, I don't see why the climate should stop the crusts going um, stop the crusts going hard or stop make sorry i don't see why the crust should go soft because of the climate it could be still the humidity i don't know where you live if it's very humid it could be the humidity but the same question to you are you using the casserole method because if you're not that's how you get a beautiful crust and before then i baked lots of sourdough it was nice when it came out the oven but my crust would go soft and it was really lovely the crumb was nice but i wouldn't get that crunch from a crust and it was only when i started doing the casserole method did i get that absolutely gorgeous you know crisp sort of baguette type crust on it um so here's a nice question how do you know if you've overproved um have you ever overproved a loaf do you know can, can we 
discuss this? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes if uh, I, I've done it a couple of times um, in the fridge, I've kind of let, left it in the banetons in the fridge too long. And I do find that I get like wider bubbles and a lot more bubbles in the bread, um, a, a stronger flavour. Yeah. Um, that's sort of like the identifying factors. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing sometimes, you know, it just, it's a stronger, stronger flavour. Um, so in the other way of telling it is that you, you don't want, like, it's not, it's not a standard bread. You don't want it to, to double in size. You, know, you only want it to come out about a third. You want a lot of that energy that the, the, the bacteria is going to expel to happen in the fridge. So if it is incredibly active and it's been really warm and your dough has gone into the banneton and you've opened it up the fridge and it's kind of it's and it was it was halfway up before and now it's kind of falling over the edges, it's chance are it's overproved and I would say to turn it into turn it into focaccia. Um, you can try and bake it, you'll get a lovely bread as you said, you'll get a really lovely, bubbly, um, sour flavoured bread, but it will it might pancake. And I've had lots of bread pancake on me in the pot. And I have to say, some of the best flavoured and some of the best crumb I've had have been from loaves that don't look like much on the outside. But actually, when you cut into them, you get this gorgeous bread because it's like the catcher. But to hold its shape, if something's overproved, it means that the gluten's been overstretched and you're not going to get that burst of energy in the, um, in the, in, in the oven. So... Um, Here's a nice question. Ideas for discard. What do you use your discard for? Uh, okay, can you use a ceramic or glass casserole? You can use anything as long as it's proof and as long as it as long as it traps your um, as long as it traps the steam in, then you can use anything. They've got another really nice question. What's the secret to sourdough printer? The secret to sourdough printer would be, I'd say, you must take the hydration a little bit. So, uh, where I generally use, I generally use like 325 to 350 grams of water to 500 grams of flour for bread. I would only use about 300 grams of water for pizza because um, I, I, I want a kind of I want a denser, slightly dough. But I would say the big secret to it, and if you go to bbcgoodfood.com and you look up the sourdough pizza recipe, a big secret to it is cooking it. And I'm sure you've tried it, Anna. And it doesn't have to be with sourdough pizza, but the absolute game changer, a bit like the casserole dish with sourdough, is cooking pizza in a frying pan. It's been like one of the revelations, one of, the revelations of, of, of lockdown. But we were doing it beforehand. And when you think about the science behind it, it does replicate a pizza oven. So the, listen, this isn't just about sourdough pizza. If you want to change the way that you cook pizza at home, cook, turn your grill on and cook it in a frying pan. So what you do is you get your frying pan, you roll out your pizza base, you put your pizza base in the frying pan while it's still on the heat, then you've got a 30 second window to top your pizza and then you top it as quickly as you can and then you get that pan under a preheated grill and you will have the best pizza you've ever made at home you can forget pizza stones you can forget hot trays you can forget all the other tricks you can pay to do with so what is the secret to making Beautiful pizza. Um, the sourdough, whether it's that pizza, that pizza, that pizza, that pizza. My bread went my so bread flat, went so flat, flat it's out of the baton. Is this because I didn't change it? Well, I would say that's because um, um, that's because of the heat. If it was this week, it was because of the heat. You want to turn the fridge up a little bit. But I would imagine it was slightly over the fridge. You can exactly the same thing as you did before. Then it's just drop your hydration down. As I said, I've dropped my hydration down by five percent. So I've taken that two, that twenty grams of water out of my recipe because everything seems to be going bonkers because it's so warm. Um, here's a good one. What's the most disastrous loaf you've ever made? Ah, oh, here we go. Uh, I've made a few disastrous loaves. Like you can become a you can become a, a, a proper sourdough. Proper sourdough without without burning a few loaves and you, you learn right. with sourdough you, you definitely learn by your mistakes and it take you know there was there was a good six months of 
bad bread before I before I got to to to, to a, a moment when I was happy. But however bad it was, apart from the ones that turned out like charcoal, however bad it was, it was always delicious. I mean, it might not have been Instagram friendly. The flavour was always there. I was always eating it, and I always so disastrous lows. You know, they're not so, and. You know, that is how, you, honestly, you do learn by your mistakes. Um, so we did say we've got some really exciting news. It's, it's Anna, I'm so sorry about this tech. Hopefully we'll have it sorted by next Thursday and we'll be able to do this properly, um, the two of us. But we did say we'd have some really exciting news. We are going to be having a webinar. So a week tomorrow, we're going to be doing a live webinar. So that's going to be me teaching you how to make sourdough live. We're doing a live Q&A. There are... Um, there are lots of uh, there's lots of information on the um, on the bbcgoodfood.com. So that's our live webinar. You can book slots. I've done a comprehensive step by step video to how we make sourdough be available for all questions, um, and that's going to be a week tomorrow. So that's the third of July, and that's really really exciting. I'm really looking forward to that. So please 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 book into that. Um, if you're looking for lots of support and inspiration for perfect, perfectual cooking and baking, then please join our group, BBC Good Food Together. In fact, I need to get back onto there. I need to. I haven't logged onto that for a day or two, so I'm going to be back onto that. That's our Facebook group, BBC Good Food Together. There you can post your cooking photos um, with hashtag Stay Safe Get Cooking, so we can see what you've been making and maybe even repost your your photos. Guys, I'm sorry about the technical issues today. Hopefully, we've answered all your questions. Hopefully, we've given you a bit more insight into how to bake lovely sourdough at home. Thank you for all your support. Thank you for constantly watching. Uh, we will have more Q&As for you next week. And next Thursday will be another sourdough Q&A. So we'll have answer more questions then. And next Friday will be our sourdough webinar. Anna, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not really... <laughs> Been, been involved, I've been uh, having technical issues, but I'm back now to say goodbye. <laughs> okay, fantastic. I'll see you later. Okay, bye. bye.